We adjust to the breaking news as well. This happening just moments ago. News getting out moments ago and the San Diego Padres uh, putting out the announcement uh, announcing that their chairman and owner Peter Seidler has passed away today. Peter Seidler, a baseball royalty grandson of Walter O'Malley. Uh, took the reins fully of the Padres, took over in late 2020. He was only 63 years old. It was known that he was not well, that he was battling illness, uh, was being described as a two-time cancer survivor in reports. Uh, don't have any exact cause of death, but we knew he hadn't been well. But still, uh, as news gets out, Mark, and uh, you know this is getting around even when I told you earlier that we had just been informed, it still comes as a shock. 63 years old, we knew he hadn't been well, but Peter Seidler passes away. Yeah, 63 years old, obviously far too young. Uh, you think about the impact that Peter Seidler had on this franchise since taking over uh, as the lead uh, owner in, in November of 2020. You know, they brought on a lot of big names, big talent, really rebuilt this team to, to be a contender. They broke a 14-year playoff drought. They got to an NLCS. And, you know, he had grand plans of, of seeing the Padres' first World Series championship and talked about whether the parade would be uh, on land or on sea or maybe both. Uh, so this was a, a guy who really cared about this team and the fan base in the city uh, and uh, obviously a terrible loss. Yeah, no question. I mean, that push, again, really transformed San Diego yeah. baseball. And we've seen that even with last year. It didn't work out as far as making the playoffs. Uh, the push with money, with payroll. Normally, Al, they, they hover around 18th or 25th. Yeah. The whole thing on Juan Soto and what's going to happen now at the club. We change gears now on this. Uh, but they vaulted to number three last year. And a lot of that seems to be was the push that Peter Seidler wanted to make that and the Padres wanted to make that happen now. Yeah, so obviously we don't know how long uh, – Peter was sick, right? I mean, I think there's probably some association to what you just described it with, uh, what were they, prior to him becoming a general partner or, or lead owner after uh, Ron Fowler stepped aside, they were right about what you said, about 23rd. Uh, in 2019, they were 23rd in payroll. Mm. Uh, November 20, he takes over, and then they go from uh, 23rd to 9th to 5th to 3rd in payroll. And we know the moves that they made. Uh, in Kind of in conjunction when this, uh, when the when the when Chargers go up to L.A. and they're the only Major League franchise in a great city. So uh, it's sad, right? I'm 63 years old, way too young, yeah. um, and clearly made a push to uh, you know to win for it. For yeah. him. Uh, again, uh, Padres also looking at, and we'd seen uh, earlier this year, that they were going to have to be cutting payroll as well. You wonder, and we were wondering openly, can the market sustain that type of a high payroll? Again, this is their number three in payroll when the Mets were number one and were the highest of all time. Mm -hmm. uh, it started, obviously, with Manny Machado, kind of the building block of the new Padres, which they largely, it's funny, I haven't thought about it, even with the what happened to them this summer, which was very disappointing on the field. They transformed what they were doing in the ballpark. They transformed yeah. what they were doing and what they meant to the city as far as baseball. Yeah, but they have a waiting list for season tickets there. Yeah. That's not something we ever thought about mm -hmm. in San Diego before. I actually take this back to Eric Hosmer signing there uh, as sort of the first yeah. building block. It was the first yeah. time yeah. where people said, hmm, the Padres are going to spend some money. And then all of a sudden it was Machado, and then it was signing Tatis to his extension. Will Myers, too. Will Myers. <laughs> right, to his big extension. And then you, right. Darvish, and last winter with Bogarts. And, you know, even if the Padres wind up trading Juan Soto this offseason, they're still a very talented team. Mm. This is still a team with some big stars, and if they're able to trade Soto and bring in the right pieces, they could contend next year even trading the guy who was their best offensive player right. in 2023. Well, you wonder, it, 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 does this facilitate that? I mean, I, I don't. Obviously, we're not in the, in the room making the decisions, but you know, how do they go forward with, uh, you know, with the, the the ownership or the person uh, heading the ownership as they move forward? Because, right, I, I, as an ex-player, and then having always heard that San Diego was a smaller market, and then to see what's transpired since 2019, the lower third of payroll historically, and then they come up in the top five mm. this past year, top three. You know, where do, where does that go? What's that look like? And you mentioned Soto. You know, is that somebody they explore um, to save? Because it looks like his AAV or somewhere uh, that he'll get an arbitration around 27 million. Maybe maybe over. 30. Maybe even more 30. Yeah. So I mean. Yeah, look, right. There, there are this things sad for the Padre right. family. There, there, there are things that, that they're going to have to take care of. Uh, they were even, you know, again, before uh, 
Peter Seidler's passing now that we're looking at cutting payroll to yeah. 200 million. There are teams that win at 70 million. We're going to be talking about the raise coming up, so it's possible <laughs> to do without money. Yeah. But it is, it, you can put yourself in a different circumstance with money. And a lot of times this does come up. And again, you talk to a lot of baseball owners. Uh, the owner matters, right? Mm -hmm. The owner matters a lot. We talk about like the model franchises and stability and having good decision making. It does start at the top. Absolutely, and it always has. I mean, I always go back to my experience in Toronto. Um, and I know it was, um, you know, owned by Labatt's, and there was a couple owners, Mr. Hardy and Mr. Whittington, but, you know, it flowed down to Paul Beeston. And there was the understanding of what ownership wanted, what they expected, the type of people in, within the organization, therefore the players, which, uh, what they expected out of you. And, of course, payroll was always correlated with it. I, I know you got Tampa Bay Rays and different clubs that have, have really kind of been the aberration of, of winning with not having, you know, the high payroll guys. But, um, no, I, I think that's really important. It's important in every organization. If you have an ownership or an owner that, you know, the people underneath respect and uh, look up to and uh, admire, you know, truly. And yeah. we had that for years up in Toronto. I know we did. Yeah. Uh, you played in New York. There was an owner there that probably made some headlines and set the tone there as well, right? Well, that is true. But a little I was differently. A, I, was a young, I was a young guy before I got traded from. You from, weren't talking to uh, Mr. Steinbrenner, as we were You know, we knew uh, when he then, walked yeah. through the room. <laughs> and I was just a young kid. And I'd look at Ron Guidry or Manning there, those guys, and say, uh, is this about when I, like, jump out of the room? Everybody knew when he walked yeah. in the ballpark, forget into the room. But we knew what he wanted, always. Winning. Winning champion. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, again, and, you know, again, I mentioned uh, the grandson of Walter O'Malley, you know, Peter O'Malley. That, again, that's yeah. baseball royalty. goes yeah. back to the Brooklyn Dodgers, Los Angeles Dodgers, and Peter Seidler building something that he could be proud of there in San Diego as well. And Peter O'Malley was his uncle and was part of the ownership group yeah. that, that bought the Padres back in 2012, along with Ron Fowler uh, and Peter Seidler. So, you know, he, Peter Seidler got involved in this in 2012, watched, learned, mm -hmm. and then – Eight years later, took the reins, and what he's done, uh, what he accomplished in the last three years, just turning San Diego from mm -hmm. sort of perennial also ran that maybe had a chance every once in a while to compete into a team that, uh, you know, went into each season with big thoughts and big dreams. I picked them to win the World Series this year. I wouldn't have done that five years ago. Right, right. Uh, didn't work out so well for my prediction, but uh, when you look at what they've become in the last few years, this is a team and with a, with a general manager who's been very aggressive. The general manager can't get that aggressive without the blessing of ownership. Mm -hmm. Right, of course. Right, AJ right. Preller couldn't go out and sign all of these guys and give Tatis an extension and, uh, you know, give Machado an extension. You can't do that without blessing of the guy who's writing the checks. And Peter Seidler was willing to make that happen. Great point. And, and, uh, and listen, life evolves, right? It's all fluid as we live every day. But, uh, you know, there was a, a firewall between – Major League staff, players, general manager, you knew of the owner, but now I think the, the collaboration, if you will, of how interactive owners are now, um, it's, it's right in front of you. Uh, you know, clearly the amount of money that they invest in these players. I mean, they're, they're small mini corporations within, within each player, you know, in the clubhouse, two, three hundred million dollar uh, yeah. commitments to these guys. But owners are much more, uh, in front. It also, right, and Peter Seidler, by the way, like you ran Seidler Equity Partners, right? So it was a private equity fund. Many of the owners of today are, are in hedge funds or in finance, are, yeah. have economic backgrounds, have understood the transformation of the, the money ball revolution and understanding, hmm, there's a relationship between data and the product on the field. Ultimately, right, even we're going to be talking about Steve Cohen. He's got a new manager now in Carlos Mendoza. We'll talk about that. Um, the guys who understand that then have uh, they do. It's, it is more of a collaboration. It's not just the, the big guy upstairs. Yep. It's more of a collaboration. I know even conversations I've had with A.J. Preller have been that, you know, that acquisition just got much more automatic that Peter Seidler was willing to follow the vision, back it up with money and make them relevant again. Yeah. And even though the Padres, <clears throat> excuse me, never got to the World Series under his ownership, never won the World Series for the first time in their franchise under his ownership. He will be remembered as the person who brought mm -hmm. or at least helped lead the way to bring the Padres back into relevance in San Diego because they are more relevant now in San Diego mm -hmm. than they've probably ever been, including the 1984 and 1998 teams that made it to the World Series. The Padres are more of the city's consciousness right now 
than they've been in a long time, and I think Peter Seidler deserves a lot of credit for that. Also, look, there's there's the core that is there. Um, as far as Fernando Tatis, Zender Bogarts, Manny Machado was just extended. They've got three players. Like, whatever happens with Juan Soto, yes or no, um, without even getting into the extensions that they had for Hugh Darvish, Jake Cronenworth, yeah. they've got a core that's going to be there a long time. Yeah, no question. Like I said, they're, they're not looking to go into a rebuild now. This was not, even with all the talk about Juan Soto, whether he's going to be traded or not, you know, three, two and a half years ago, or a year and a half ago, when they traded for Soto, they dumped a whole lot of prospect capital out to bring him in for two and a half years. If they trade him now with a year left, they're not looking for prospect capital in return necessarily. They're looking for major league ready players right. who can help supplement that core you just mentioned. Right, they've got two guys at the top of their rotation in Darvish and Musgrove, very good pitchers. You've got Machado, Bogarts, Tatis in the middle of your lineup. That's that's a, a yeah. legitimate middle of your lineup. They're going to be looking for pieces who can come in and help this team right now win this year. Yes. So while you're not going to get back somebody with the impact of Juan Soto, you can bring back right. three or four guys who can complement your team in ways that you don't have those players right now, and all of a sudden maybe you're. I out there challenging. I was unaware title. of what you just said a little while ago about uh, there's a list, uh, a wait list for season tickets. Like, think about that. San Diego, I mean, I played in old Jack Murphy Stadium, the, the multi-state, uh, multi-purpose stadium, and now the beautiful ballpark. Peck Gorgeous now, yeah. Uh, but I love the fact that that fans identify in a city that they love their Padres, that they're coming out, buying season tickets as a result of ownership, pushing the chips in. You know, you like to see that, that there's a correlation with added fans and revenue with respect to what they're spending. And like BK said, with the Chargers moving up the road, they're the only show in town. Yeah, that's right. So if you're a native of San Diego, this is your sports pride. This is what you have. And it's been nice to see the Padres put the resources into the yep. team on the field, into the ballpark, into the experience of going to a Padres game to make that city proud and want to come out and support them the way they have. I'm glad you just said that, right. I had even forgotten in, in all this, and again, passing along the sad news, uh, they had worked, the Padres had worked very hard at the fan experience. Yeah. It's a reason why that place was just rocking all the time. The team on the field, also just everything that they did there. Again, the sad news that we're passing along, uh, this breaking just before we came on the air, Peter Seidler, 63 years old, owner of the San Diego Padres, passing away. He had battled cancer before. He had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, he had been involved in many philanthropic uh, enterprises in San Diego and battling homelessness and also standing up to cancer, the American Cancer Society. And he has passed away uh, today at the age of 63. This coming out from Ken Rosenthal. Peter Seidler loved his team, loved his city, always upbeat, wanted nothing more than to bring a World Series title to San Diego. And from our own Jason Stark, rest in peace to Peter Seidler. No owner in baseball was a greater cheerleader for his city and his team. He may have spent above his team's means, but he refused to accept the popular notion that San Diego was just another small market mm. that couldn't compete. It's hard not to admire that. Again, Peter Seidler, owner of the San Diego Padres, was 63 years old.